Salute omnes, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to be working our way through Caesar Book 5, chapters 28 and 29, following the AP Latin syllabus. Before we begin, as ever, just a quick review of how our color coding here works. Any words you see in red, those are indicated as subjects. The words in green are our verbs, and anything showing up in blue is a direct object, regardless of whether or not it's accusative. Otherwise, if you see something in bold print, that indicates that it is the main clause of the sentence, and anything not in bold is not part of the main clause, for some reason or another. All right, and with that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive in. So, chapter 28 begins just as Ambiorix has finished sharing his thoughts with the Romans, specifically the emissaries Arpinaeus and Unius, and so naturally we start off with those two. All right, Arpinaeus and Unius. And then we get this quai, all right? And we look around and we see this quai here. It's not anything feminine that it can be referring to. And so when we see a quai in the wild with no obvious antecedent, we could be looking at a feminine, we could be looking at a neuter, but 95% of the time we're looking at a neuter. So we understand ea is missing as the antecedent, and we understand it to be the things. So Arpinaeus and Unius... The things that they heard, right, this quai is accusative, not nominative, because things can't hear. The things that they heard to the commanders they brought, all right? So Arpinaeus and Unius reported back to their commanders about what they had heard. And then we dive right in with Illy, which is, as we can see here, Illy Perturbati. Okay, so we see that they are the commanders. Remember, anytime we see Illy, we have indicated a subject change. So previously it was Arpinaeus and Unius. Now we're talking about the other people, which would be the legati. So they were disturbed by, this little ablative, by this sudden or unexpected or unlooked-for thing. Uh, Repentina Ray, the unlooked-for thing, is referring perhaps not only to the attack on the camps, but also the message that Ambiorix gave, which would be, to wit, that all of Gaul has risen up in rebellion against the Romans. Etsi ab hoste ea dicibantur, so etsi uh, indicating a concessive clause, meaning although, although by the enemy these things, okay, here's the actual, here's an actual ea, right, whereas in the previous sentence we only had a quai, these things were said, this time ea is the subject of the passive verb, nevertheless, not to be neglected, notice that negligenda is indicated as a verb, that means there is an essay missing. All right. Negligenda is, in fact, a gerundive, which means that negligenda essay would create a passive periphrastic construction. Get used to that, because in this particular passage that we're working on here, we're going to see, be seeing passive periphrastics frequently. As ever, the uh, passive periphrastic, the gerundive with essay, carries a sense of must be done. So in this case, these things must not be neglected, existimabant, they thought, and so maxime hacre permoevantur, greatly by this thing, that, is, that would be the situation, they were disturbed. All right, remember that moveo is frequently in Latin used to refer to emotional state, not necessarily just physical. So they were moved emotionally, intellectually, etc., etc. So they were upset. Okay, continuing on, uh, why were they upset? Quote, just a straight because. Uh, because, and then we can read this, let's read this straight as it comes, and then we'll talk about how it all comes together. Because a tribe, low-born and not very powerful, remember, just like in the previous chapter, uh, chapter 27, when Ambiorix was speaking, he talked about humilitate, and while that is related to the English word humility, that's not really what it means here. Here it means close to the ground, therefore low status, right? Humus being the noun that these words are ultimately derived from. So low status, a tribe that was low-born and low status, the tribe of the Eburones. This is a third declension genitive plural with this ending because the tribe name is Eburones. Sua sponte, ablative, by their own free will, something like that. Populo Romano, bellum facere ausam. There is an esse missing here with ausam, ausam esse. The people of Rome to wage war against would dare, right? Ausam esse, this is from the semi-deponent verb audeo. Wix erat credendum. It was scarcely 
to be believed. Here again, we see that passive periphrastic construction, uh, the gerundive with a form of esse, uh, conveying the sense of must be done. Remember, Carthago delenda est, Carthage must be destroyed. Okay, now we notice here that this is actually where we want to begin with Wix erat credendum if we were to understand this more naturally in English and technically. The subject of erat, which is to say the thing that credendum is modifying uh, or referring to, the thing that is not to be believed, is all of this. Okay, this entire indirect expression, or this expression that's rendered in a sort of indirect discourse kind of way, with uh, the accusative being the subject of the infinitive ausam esse, is being taken as the subject of Wix erat credendum. All right, this thing here was scarcely to be believed. That is to say, the fact that, you see how we then wind up in this kind of oratio obliqua situation, this low-born and pathetic tribe of the Eberones of their own free will would dare to wage war against the Roman people. That is the subject of erat. And so, next sentence is dead simple, and so to a council, all right, concilium here, this is, again, uh, not a plan, but the body that makes a plan. So to a council, the thing they brought, so they brought this matter to a discussion, and magna, we see Caesar indulging here in a little bit of a chiastic arrangement, right, with uh, magna controversy, or possibly it's a little hyperbaton with the separation of the adjective and the noun. A great controversy, so a great um, debate existed among them, and what we're going to be reading now in the rest of this chapter and chapter 29 is going to be the contents of that debate. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, on the first side of the debate, we see Lucius Arunculeus. This is Cotta, remember, right? This is his full name. Cotta, one of the commanders, complures que tribuni militum, and many, not just a lot, but many tribunes of the soldiers. Okay, so these would be the uh, essentially the officers. And First rank centurions, literally, of course, we see primorum, right, ordinum, this tells us that it's genitive, uh, centurions of the first rank, okay, so these would be um, non-commissioned officers, essentially, right, something equivalent to sergeants in today's American military, uh, and the fact that they are primorum ordinum indicates that they are veterans, because they have served long enough to enter the first ranks, what is their position? We notice that you notice that we go directly into what appears to be indirect speech with uh, accusative-looking subjects and verbs that don't seem to have anything, which means there's an essay missing. So, what is their thought? All right, quite simply, nothing rashly agendum esse, passive paraphrastic, must be done. Nothing must be done rashly. Temere is just an adverb. Nor from the camps, right, from the winter camps, with literally in the lacking of an order of Caesar, right? So yusu we've seen before, meaning the order. So therefore, in yusu is the lack of orders, all right? So we would say something like sine yusu, without an order, but Latin uses, you know, Caesar uses this somewhat odd-sounding expression, uh, in the absence of an order uh, of Caesar, must there be a departure? Remember that with passive paraphrastics, you often see datives of agent. Obviously, we don't see them here, but they are implied. Uh, nothing rashly must be done elise by them, nor from the camps must there be a departure elise by them. So in English, we would simply say they must not depart. All right, without an order from Caesar. Let's continue on down here a bit. Uh, they were thinking. Okay, so here we see the head verb that governed all that indirect speech we just went through. So their thought was that they should not do anything rash, nor should they uh, leave the camps in the absence of an order from Caesar. Going on, still an in indirect speech, uh, quantas vis magnas copias. We see this word here, quantas vis. Yes, this is from the verb wolo welle. No, it is not really functioning as a verb here. It's kind of ceased to be a verb. Uh, you get this word instead, quantus vis. Um, however much you like. So it's it's kind of just an abstract uh, quantity, right? Not just how great, but however great you want it to be, all right? However great the forces of the Germans, right? It goes with magnas copias, right? Howsoever great the forces of the Germans. 
um, they can be endured. Notice this passive infinitive, sustineo, sustineri. Uh, they can be endured by, maybe with, possibly in, the munitis ibernis. Okay, the, uh, the function of the ablative here is somewhat up for discussion. The passive verb, sustineri, suggests ablative of means. Um, the fact that we're talking about the winter camps might imply ablative of place where, but uh, it's up to you. The passive here does indicate that means is likely. Uh, Dokebant, they were teaching literally, but we could say saying or advising. All right. And then, continuing on, so they can endure the uh, attack of the enemy here in their camps, and then they say rem esse testimonio. Literally, this thing is for the purpose of proof. We see the testimonio here is a dative. It is a dative of purpose. In English, we might just say, this was the proof, but in Latin, instead, we say, this thing is for proof. Quod, because, or the fact that, right? But let's go with because. Because the first enemy attack. So hostium here we see is genitive, right? Hoste is third declension, um, with an I, so it's an I stem word, right? It just is, hostis, hostis. Uh, the first attack of the enemy, with many wounds having been given on both sides. That's the, that's the idea of this, uh, this word, ilatis, right? On both sides. With many wounded indeed on both sides, they most bravely, or most heroically, uh, endured. So same, same verb as before, sustenere. So they endured the first attack of the enemy, and in fact, they inflicted a great number of wounds upon the enemy. So they hurt the enemy. Therefore, they can stay in the winter camps and see this out. Then they go on, right? Still, uh, still talking about how they can endure it right here. Re frumentaria. We notice here that this is an ablative, right? Re frumentaria. So therefore, something like by the situation of the grain. This is actually an adjective, frumentaria. Non premi. They were not being pressed. This passive infinitive right here from premere. So say, of course, is missing as the subject. Um, or possibly, you know, illos, nostros, right, our men, were not pressed, so we were not in any distress with regard to or by the grain situation. Meanwhile, in Terea, continuing on to the next point, both, we see et, et, indicating a both and set up here, both from the nearby camps and from Caesar would come help. Okay, we see conventura, we see the ura in there, so that's we know that that's a future participle. The essay is missing. Subsidia is therefore the accusative subject of it. Um, so they are actually expecting help to come to them from either Caesar or from one of the nearby camps, possibly Cicero, possibly Labienus. And then finally, quid essay levius aut turpius? What is its essay? Because we're generally governed here by oratio obliqua, indirect speech. What is literally lighter, so therefore something like less serious, again, levis, uh, light, the opposite is gravis, which means heavy, but also serious or of great import. So what is less serious or more shameful? Okay, notice these comparative adjectives. They are adjectives because they're technically modifying quid, all right, this neuter question. All right, what is less serious, or you might say more frivolous, or more shameful? What is more shameful than, right? These comparatives have set up this qualm, which is than. Auctore hoste, we see this is an ablative absolute, with an enemy as the author, or, you know, in this case, the giver of the plan. To seize a plan, let's just jump down here, right? To take a plan, considering literally the highest matters, but something like, you know, very important affairs, okay? All right, so they, they are asking the obvious question, why are we listening to the enemy when it comes to making our plans concerning affairs of great import, life and death, literally? All right, so that is one side of the debate having been heard from. Now, as we go into chapter 29, contra ea, just a prepositional phrase, in response to these things, right? Opposing these things. Titurius, this is Sabinus, okay? Uh, we notice that Titurius, at least in the text here, is on his own. Titurius, 
Uh, we go directly into the indirect speech, and we see facturos. There's an essay missing. We also see the os on facturos, indicating that we understand the subject to be masculine plural, so they. Illos, you know, nostros, our men, the Romans. They would act, right, facio, would do things serro, this adverb, too late, all right, specifically, not just late, but too late. Clamitabat, he kept shouting. Notice the, uh, the note tells you that clamitabat is a frequentative form of the verb clamare. All right, so he didn't just shout it, but he kept on shouting it. That little nuance of translation there. Cum, we see the cum, we cast our eyes down here real quick. Ah, it's subjunctive, pluperfect subjunctive. So let's try because. Because larger bands of the enemy. Now this is important here. Notice the maior, comparative form. So not just, Sabinus is talking here not just about the large group of Gauls that have attacked them already, but even larger groups of the enemy adjunctis germanis, another ablative absolute, with Germans having been added to the mix, literally having been joined to them. Uh, convenicent, had, right, pluperfect, had already gathered. This is, of course, according to what Ambiorix told them. All right, let's continue on. Or because, all right, why would they be too late? Because something of a calamity. So, some kind of misfortune. This is a partitive genitive. We see this a lot with words like uh, aliquid, you know, aliquis, aliquid, something of a thing, right? So that's how in Latin we would say something like some misfortune, all right? Some undefined misfortune. In the nearby camps, uh, esta had been literally received, but we might say had happened, all right? So Sabinus believes, essentially, what Ambiorix was saying, that there are very large bands of the enemy coming, uh, they have already gathered, and there's Germans now, or the other camps have met with their own misfortune, and therefore cannot be relied upon to lend aid. Brevem consulendi. You'll notice, by the way, that we are staying in indirect speech here. That is going to be the case for the rest of this chapter, chapter 29. Echoes of chapter 27, with Ambiorix's speech, all an indirect statement? Oh, yes. Brevem Consulendia silcationem. Notice again, Caesar deploying a slight chiastic arrangement here. Um, it makes the most sense, perhaps, to read it backwards. Uh, the occasion of talking, right, or debating, okay, this gerund is going with occasionem, just a gerund, not a gerundive. It is genitive and it's not modifying anything. The time for talking is short, okay, or brief. Okay, now, Continuing on here, um, we, arbitrary actually comes first. We have basically two layers of indirect speech going on here. Arbitrary, so this is Sabinus. Sabinus thought, right? He said that he thought that. We go a little deeper. Caesar, okay? The reason that we do that is because arbitrary is a deponent verb, right? You might read this the first time and say, oh, look, it's a passive. Caesar was thought to have left. But arbitrator is deponent, so it's actually active. So it's not being thought, it's having thought. So Sabinus thought that Caesar had left, right? We go down here to Profectum Esse, modifying Caesarem, to Italy. And then he gives his reasons why, essentially, he thinks this. Not otherwise, right? We've seen this aliter before, right? Otherwise then, aliter ac, uh, superioribus anis, back in the beginning of this whole book five, where Caesar had to deploy his troops differently than in previous years. Uh, same thing here, not otherwise, not otherly, right? Would the carnutes, and then to understand it, we have to go down here to fuise capturos, would have seized, all right? So what's going on here? So this future participle here, capturos, which is carnutes is its subject, essay is missing. Uh, excuse me, essay is not missing. Essay is right here, fuise. But why is it in the perfect infinitive and not just essay, the normal slash present infinitive? Uh, that's because this is essentially sort of a pluperfect kind of infinitive with future force. Because the effect is they would not have done this, but they did do it. Okay, and we'll talk about why this is all like this here in a second when we get down to the uh, the C clause. Um, so... 
Caesar is gone to Italy. Why does he think this? Well, if it weren't the case, not otherwise, if it weren't the case, the Carnutes would not have, right, because the Neque is still in force, would not have seized a plan of murdering Tasgetius. Notice that this interficiendi is not a gerund. It is actually a gerundive because Tasgeti is here for it to modify. All right, and of course the genitive is all working with concilium. The plan of killing Tasgetius. So the Carnutes would never have taken up the plan to murder Tasgetius, nor, let's continue on here, try to keep it all on one screen, nor would the Eberones, and this is where this all starts to make sense, if he were present. The he is Caesar, the only other person we've talked about in this sentence, um, and the tense of Adeset, the tense and mood of Adeset, is imperfect subjunctive. Therefore, and the note helps you with this in your books, we are looking at a contrary to fact conditional. Contrary to fact indicating that the understood implication of this statement, if he were here, but he isn't, is the understood context of that. If Caesar were here, but he is not, the Carnutes would not have taken up a plan to kill Tasgetius, but they did, nor would the Eburones, let's just come down here to this, have come to our camps, but they did, because of this, uh, this, this contrary to factness conveyed by this imperfect subjunctive here in the C clause. And then let's just finish this off with this ablative, okay, of manner, with such, or so great, with such contempt or uh, lack of respect for us, or you could say for our men. The nostri here is the, is the Romans. Um, the nostri, the form is genitive, singular, even though we understand it to be plural because the Romans are plural. So in English, right, we would say of us. Um, and the reason it is genitive is because it is an objective genitive. Nostri is, we are the object, we, the Romans, are the object of the uh, contempt of the Eberones. They have no respect for us. Okay. Uh, let's continue on. Now Sabinus is getting on a roll here, listing his various reasons for thinking this. So uh, he then goes on to say that, and say is the subject here. You notice that hostem actorum and rem are both indicated as objects. Say, he, Sabinus, is the understood subject here of spectare. Okay? He, Sabinus, was not looking at, we might say, the fact that the enemy was the author of the plan. There's an essay missing in here, right? Like, where's the essay? It's right there. You could understand it that way. You don't have to, though. So Sabinus was not looking at the fact that the enemy was the creator of the plan, but what was he looking at? He was looking at the rem. He was looking at the situation, okay? He says, Sabinus says. And then he starts listing all the various things that he feels make up the situation. First of all, sub esse renum, all right? Renum indicated as the subject, because we are, of course, still in indirect speech. Literally, the Rhine, sub esse, means something like to be nearby, okay? The Rhine is nearby, that is a fact. Uh, magno esse Germanis dolori. So here we get a whole list of things, well, two things, mortem and superiors nostras victorias, that are the subjects of esse. So here we are looking again at a double dative construction with magno dolori being dative, in this case, the dative of purpose, and Germanis, also dative, being the dative of reference or possibly interest. It's not really worth trying to distinguish because uh, they both mean essentially the same thing. Something was literally for the purpose of a great pain with reference to the Germans or for the Germans, dative of interest, right? Uh, so the idea here is that these things, in English we would just say something was a source of great pain for the Germans. Well, what was a source of great pain for the Germans? Well, you have the death of Ariovistus. This is a fellow from earlier in the story, a leader of the Germans whom Caesar defeated and killed. So the death of Ariovistus is a source of great grief or anguish for the Germans. And the recent victories of ours was also a source of great grief for the Germans. Caesar has been um, attacking the Germans uh, successfully from time to time, like you do when you're Caesar. And so the Germans, therefore, are understandably pissed off at the Romans. And so perhaps they are taking advantage of this opportunity to exact some revenge, Sabinus seems to think. 
also, moving on down, uh, Ardere Galiam. So we read this backwards. Galiam is indicated as the subject. Gaul is on fire. Gaul is also angry, up in arms. Uh, tot contumeli is aceptis. This is actually an ablative absolute, so we could say something like on account of or because of so many um, shames, right, or so many griefs that were received, right, griefs or shame, so much shame having been accepted. Uh, and then galiam, now we notice here redactam is not indicated as a verb. There's no essay missing here. It's simply a participle describing gall. Gall, that has been reduced, or we would say conquered, right, under the rule, or brought under the rule of the Roman people. Sub is taking imperium as its object. I know that we don't always see sub with an accusative object in the preposition, but we can see it also with an ablative. But in this case, uh, it is working as the uh, prepositional phrase, sub imperium, and then the genitive, populi romani. So Gaul, having been brought under the rule of the Roman people, with so many insults having been accepted, okay, that's why they're on fire. Also, sort of another reason, okay, another ablative absolute, by the way, standing, you know, in parallel to contumelis aceptis, uh, also because of the fact that their superiore gloria, re militaris, has been extincta. Their previous um, glory, but their previous renown or fame, we would say in Latin uses the genitive of military affairs, so of fighting, right, has been wiped out. So Gaul used to be known as this place where you had these awesome warriors who fought and did amazing uh military exploits, that's all been extinguished as Gaul has been brought under the rule of the Roman people. Therefore, that along with the various insults that they have received, therefore, all of Gaul is on fire. And so naturally, they are rebelling against the Romans. Okay, continuing on then, furthermore, or finally, we might say, or next, literally, who would persuade this thing to himself? All right, kind of a, just a sort of a rhetorical question. Uh, Sabinus is throwing out there. In English, we would simply say something like, who would believe this, right? But Latin is very particular with the object and then the dative of reference, right? Because persuadio wants a dative. Uh, sometimes, who would persuade this to himself? That, okay, um, without certa re. So this is something like, without a good reason, like a, like a sure thing, without a good reason, ambiorix to this sort of plan would descend. So who would actually believe that ambiorix would stoop, is something we might say in English, right? Would stoop to a plan of this sort if he wasn't sure. So again, taking ambiorix at his word, he's promising safe passage, he says all of Gaul is up in arms, right? He pretend, you know, he was saying that he's being kind of secretive and trying to help Caesar at the same time as he's helping his tribe. And so Sabinus appears to believe Ambiorix, and so he asks the question, why would Ambiorix, you know, use such a, such a plan as this if, if it wasn't actually true? Okay, Sabinus continuing on. Now he's arguing for his plan, if he's actually offered a plan. Um, his opinion in both cases, now this utramque, right, uterque means both, specifically of two, but uh, that's why we read this as if it were plural, even though literally it's singular. Okay, in both instances, right, on both sides, his idea was safe. All right, tutam, going with sententiam. And then he lists, as you can see in this lovely parallel construction, he lists both the options as he sees them. Si nihil esset durius. Notice again these um, contrary to fact statements, all right, and consentir it here as well. These uh, imperfect subjunctives, meaning that we're dealing with a contrary to fact kind of conditional. If nothing was terribly, literally hard, right, durus, hard, but if nothing was terribly dangerous or threatening, right, serious perhaps, if things are not actually that serious, right, it is comparative, so we should say very or something to that effect, then nullo cum periculo, with no danger at all, ad proximum legionem to the nearby legion, per venturos esse, they, the Romans, would come. They would make it to the nearby legion with no issue. If, on the other hand, 
Gallia omnis cum Germanis consentiret, if all of Gaul is conspiring with the Germans, or is in agreement or in alliance with the Germans, unam esse in caleritate positam salutem. Again, Caesar deploys this little chiastic arrangement. The one hope or safety or salvation is placed in swiftness. They must move quickly. Okay, now having laid out his plan, uh, Sabinus moves on to attacking the plan of uh, Colta and the others. So sure enough, um, these are genitive, Coltae and Aorum, right, going with concilium. So indeed, quidem, right, indeed, the plan of Colta and those who disagree with him, right, with Sabinus, understood, quem habere exitum? He asks the question, what end does it have? What, you know, exitum, what outcome? This is literally ex eo, right? Etum is from eo ire again. Um, what ending, what outcome does it have, their plan? In which, this is referring to the concilium, okay? Uh, again, we, we, it's Caesar, so in quo, we understand in hoc, right? In this plan, uh, si non prizens periculum sit, or eset, okay, we need to understand there's, there's a verb missing here, so it's a form of est, but it isn't est, all right, because we're in indirect speech, which means subordinate clauses tend to default to the subjunctive, so we should probably say sit or eset. It's probably eset, right, because we've been talking a lot of contrary to fact conditionals. If there is no present danger, um, at kerte, but certainly, or for sure, right, most definitely, uh, longinquo obsidione, just an ablative, right, in a long siege, right, that's an obsidione, literally uh, sid from sedeo, a sitting uh, ob in the way of or in front of, so a siege. In a long siege, fames, eset timenda, another passive paraphrastic, okay, fames, hunger must be feared. So, even if there's no immediate danger, there is the danger, if things drag out for a while, that we will all starve to death. Okay, And that is, in fact, a common thing that happens during sieges. You starve the enemy out, or you deprive them of water. And so that is now where the Romans find themselves at odds, their commanders at odds. Uh, one side arguing that they should stay and fight it out, the other side arguing that they must, in fact, do what Ambioric suggests and leaves. And we're not actually done with the debate. It is going to go on for two more chapters before things finally resolve themselves, and we will deal with that in the next video. So, maximus gratias for sticking through this one, and we will see you in the next one. Vale te omnes!